Okay, we got to go over some history though first. One, Yahweh makes a covenant with that guy, Abram, who later became Abraham. That covenant is the entire key to everything. Understand that. We are either part of that covenant or we're not. You're either born into the covenant, which I really don't think there's a whole lot of people that can definitely prove they're born into the covenant, or you're grafted into the covenant. Only two choices. That's it. But you got to be in that covenant. Now, Yahweh promises Abraham the whole land of Canaan and a physical multiplicity of his Zerah, his seed, his kids, people that come from his loins, who comes from one kid, Isaac, who comes from another kid, Jacob, who comes from 12 kids, the 12 sons of Jacob. That's how it works. Seed multiplied to the point where the, it is, there's a lot of them. He's told it to promise a physical multiplicity. I, I have to use those words because that's the important, of, the important word. Will be so vast and so extensive that the entire earth will literally be filled with his seed. Now we're going to see how a, an adoption really works shortly. It's right there in our reading. So how does his seed become all of us here? What are we dealing with? 3,000 years later-ish? Something like that? More than 3,000, I think. I don't know how many. A whole buku years. The promise and the blessing is renewed in Genesis, where Abram is told that his, this promise will establish him as the father of many nations, or the term is Hamon Goim. Now, this is Yahweh speak. As for me, look, I make, my covenant is with you, and you shall become a father of many nations. Many nations means Hamon Goim. That's the Hebrew for it. So let's do one of our little word studies. We're going to start doing this more and more. All right. Hamon. It means many. It also means, or more accurately, it really means murmur, roar, crowd, abundance, tumult, sound, noise. Goy, Gentile, nations, non-Israelite, one of them. Okay, Jews will say it means a non-Jew. Eh, no, sorry. It, it, it really means just people, Gentile, nations. And it meant all them nations around Abraham. So this term, Hamon Goim, literally means this. A noisy multitude of Gentile nations. Have you had a look at the earth these days? That, by the way, is a noisy multitude of Gentile nations. Some also say that this word or this term can refer to a noisy multitude like a mess of fish. Big wad of fish in a net. Something about Yeshua told them, go cast your net over there. And see what you catch, and he catches, they catch what, 153 fish? All kinds of fish. 153 is 153 nations. It's the goyim. It's the hamon goyim. I saw a short little YouTube video of them doing a big catch of redfish up in the, 
the Icelandic waters, and they had this net, must have been miles long. And this thing was full of fish. That's what it is. Okay, let's jump forward and get all the way to Jacob. We might say, well, Isaac isn't all that interesting, but he needed to be there very, very much because he bore Jacob. Oh, and he bore Esau, too. Hmm. That's another message. All right. At the end of Genesis, Jacob, or Israel, is about to bless his sons. Important time. Now, he's going to bless Joseph's two sons first. You're reading, reading the story, the way it goes along, he blesses Joseph's two boys, then he goes ahead and he calls the other guys and they all sit down and they all get blessed. And then he says to Joseph, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land, are mine. They are mine. Just like my natural sons, Reuben and Shimon. That's the adoption. That's what adoption means. Adoption doesn't mean, as we kind of see it here, well, now you got the name, our name, but you really came from someplace else. Actually, no. You came from me. You're mine. You are exactly like those two other guys. So when we are adopted in, we become exactly like Reuben and Shimon, Judah and Levi. We are physically Jacob's kids. So he blesses the two boys. When he's doing this, several things are taking place. This is actually his last will and, his, and testament, his last will and testament, over the two boys. And he's doing it right in front of Joseph, Joseph being the witness. And there's probably a bunch of other people around too. He officially adopts the boys so that Joseph, who is, by the way, his most beloved son, you know, coat of men in colors thing, all right, can receive a double portion of the blessing through his sons. Joseph doesn't get the blessing. His sons get the blessing. But that blessing isn't going to come right away anyway, and everybody knows it. It's going to come ahead sometime in the future. They don't know when. So it's, Joseph knows it's to his seed. And now it's official. He gets double the blessing because Ephraim and Manasseh will each get a piece of the land. And I think Pastor's going to talk about that. He also says, these two kids are Israel. He calls them Israel. He not only adopts them, but it's a prophecy he's declaring over them that the physical promise of the multiplicity given to Abraham way long time ago comes through them. Here's what it looks like. Oh. Here's how he does it. Let my name be called upon them. And he says this. Let my name, Israel, be called upon them in 48.16. So he blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. Now what he's going to do is instead of putting his right hand on the older boy, the firstborn, he puts it on the younger boy and then he crosses his hands over. It uses that word, crosses his hands over. This this kind of bugs Joseph. I mean, you know, he's, whoa, Dad, come on, man. I mean, you know, you're not that bad off. Don't do that. This one's the older and this one's the younger. And he says some very, very, very great things.
in 49, or excuse me, in, in, in uh, Genesis 48, 19, one of the most important prophecies of Scripture. And it just goes unnoticed. I know it does in the church. They ain't got a clue. Here's what it is. His father refused. I know, my son, I know. He's going to be a great people, but his younger brother is greater than he. His seed is to become the completeness of the nations or the fullness of the Gentiles. Translation thing. The seed, or Zerah, of Ephraim will become the Malo Ha Goyim. Malo Ha Goyim means the fullness of the Gentiles. Malo, see it? Malo Ha Goyim. I put that there as a slide so we know that. Here's a little word study. Malo means fullness, that which fills mass multitude. It doesn't mean full bucket, like if you had a bucket full of water. That's not it. It's fullness as in a whole concept of everything. This is going to be a mass multitude of the Gentiles. It will be all of them, or nearly so. And the word goy, we already know how goyim means nations, people. We already saw that. The physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that was promised, that will literally one day fill the earth as the sand of the sea and the dust of the earth, the stars of the heaven, will come to pass through Ephraim. Was just said. The fullness of the Gentiles, that's how it's going to happen. Ephraim's children will be everybody, all of the nations. Now, it's interesting to note, it's kind of rare that you see words used only just like one or two times. This one's used twice, the word malo, fullness, and it's used in Psalm 24, 1, where it says, wait a minute. Let's get, all right, the earth belongs to Yahweh and all that fills it. Remember that? It's also part of the hand washing blessing. The earth belongs to Yahweh and all that fills it, the world and all those who dwell in it, and those that have access to the holy mountain are the ones with clean hands. All right, what did I have here before? The earth is full of peoples, places, and things that belong to Yahweh. He made them. Something that's misunderstood. He can do whatever he wants with them. Thus, the land of Israel is his. And he can do anything he wants with it. And all our arguing, fighting, and stamping feet, and crying and whining doesn't mean anything to him at all. Oops, where was I? There's not anything on earth not that does not belong to Yahweh. Okay. There will also be virtually no one on earth. I think I find where I am here. That somehow doesn't belong to the seed of Ephraim. Long time ago, I mean, you know, back maybe 35, 40 years ago, I was thinking, well, well like, 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 what about people that live way out in the Amazon in some little place out there in the Amazon? You know, that don't never see anybody. Or how about those people in Papua New Guinea? You ever see that? There's people that out, out there that, that they said to us had never been any contact with humans. Huh, they got cell phones. But somehow everybody's going to belong to Ephraim. Somehow. They're either going to be physically belonging or adoptedly belonging. It's not going to be. He has to affect everybody. We'll see why. He's got to go and affect every single human being. 
like that. He's got the whole world in his hands. Is this the fullness of the Gentiles? I don't think there's any place on earth that hasn't got some kind of reception. There are African villages that don't have clean water, but they have internet. They got cell phones all over the world. They know. They've heard this gospel. Yahweh has seen to it. The reason the technology exists today is for us to spread that word, to spread this here word. Not 10 years ago, what we're doing here with the YouTube thing would not have been very well, very easy to do. Very thirsty these days. All right, so Rav Shaul, wait a minute. We just jumped from the Old Testament to the New Testament to Paul, the ringleader of the Christian church who did away with the Torah, the Old Testament. Not so. 